No, no, it was just a personal vacation. No, yeah, okay, no, I had nothing to do with the sanctions, okay? Betrayal? Calm down. Lying to you? Really? You want to go there? Okay, who said, hey, let's go do a press shoot? And I thought, wow, wonderful, do a little thing, we'll shake hands in front of the media, I'll talk about the rocket, and then somebody pulled out a gun. You know, no, stop, just calm down. Guess what, you know what you should do? Go to the jungle, go look for some rebels, I have something more pressing to cover. Guys, yeah, we know. Someone's wrong on the internet. You haven't fixed this yet. Yeah, you, you do realize that people are wrong on the internet all the time, right? You don't understand. They're wrong about rockets. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Fine. Let's do this. Three, two, one. Morning, everyone. I'm, uh, serious. Today, we're gonna cover two Apogee videos. Now, I have gone over both of them on a live stream, but on those, I'm more rude, crude, and, uh, addressing the allegations. Besides, both videos are wrong in a unique way that necessitates a more formal response. That's why I'm wearing a suit. Apogee is a spaceflight commentary channel run by Redacted that is here to discuss the diverse technology, design, strategy, and politics that shape our journey beyond our nest. That explains the bird logo. Way better than eager spaces. Ah! One video addresses the Starship launch market, and the other one covers the concept of Lego rockets. But before we begin, I do have a few quick notes. First, some of the concepts I'm gonna kind of run through here will be covered more in depth in my next video called, So You Still Want to Build a Low-Cost Launch Vehicle, so keep that in mind. Second, I'm talking about Starship again. Yeah, I know. So as a quick rundown, I think Starship is a boondoggle predicated on very faulty assumptions about the commercial launch market. It's oversized for low Earth orbit and to go anywhere beyond that, it needs a needlessly complex refueling architecture. Technically, Starship will work, but it's very clear that SpaceX is struggling to get it operational. And when it does become operational, I don't think Starship's gonna live up to that expectations. And thirdly, most importantly, Starship has a very aggressive and dedicated fan base that I would consider to be more akin to a cult than anything else. There, happy? Third, this is the most important one, which means I'm gonna suck at explaining it. There are layers to spaceflight enthusiasm, going from rockets are cool and you just love all rockets, that's great, and then the technical side where you want to get into, you know, your favorite architectures and designing them. I, and I suspect many other people here, are somewhere in between. We like to get into the nitty gritty details of different concepts, of technologies, of rocketry, to varying levels. Now this depends on experience and how much you like reading technical papers. For example, myself, I have an aerospace engineering degree, I work in the industry, but not the space side of things, at least not at the moment. I like reading about launch systems, private launch systems, usually with a focus on pressure-fed launch systems. But you don't see me arguing about launch vehicle electronics because that's icky and scary. Other people do. Apogee styles themselves as being somewhere in here, a serious space-like commentator that does technical assessments of systems and provides reasonable assumptions based on that. The question I'm posing to you is, are they? Should we take them seriously? Now, I wanna be clear, this isn't should we agree with them on their opinion, it's should we consider their opinion seriously? As an extreme example, if we were to ask a flat earther their opinion on the moon landings, you will get an answer. But would you consider that in a serious manner? Now, obviously, I am making a video on this, and the title probably gives it away. 
but I do encourage you, watch both those videos. I link them in the description. And, oh, and just so we're clear, don't harass or bully Apogee or its creator. Don't do that, okay? Let's get started. Interestingly enough, Is There Demand for Starship came out a month before I did my own market analysis for criticizing Starship Part 3, way back in 2021. Let's see our analyses stack up. Now, I will admit that my analysis could have been better. Done more years of launches, refined the data a bit more, but oh well. Now, we have to remember here that this data is from October and November 2021. A lot has changed since then. Keep that in mind. Oh, look at the light works. All right, so my focus was on the geostationary satellite market, which is relatively stable, and it's easy to find payload masses for that. And my analysis, which again, could have been improved, got Starship at seven to 10-ish launches per year, assuming full market control. Now, I will note that right now, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy could do basically the same job as that, probably even better than Starship because Starship is primarily a low Earth orbit optimized launcher. With the low Earth orbit market, I didn't really focus on that because it appears that the only real market that Starship could serve would be Starlink. And Starlink is a SpaceX payload, so it's internal and not a commercial launch like a geostationary satellite would be. Now, it is possible with the rise of mega constellations that we could see some emerge in the low Earth orbit market for Starship but that is yet to be seen, so I didn't focus on that. What does Apogee have to say? There's a common misconception that rockets need to fly at or near 100% capacity. This just isn't the case. Even today's expendable rockets rarely fly at their max capacities. The vast majority of payloads launching today are less than 15 tons. So how could Starship compete with smaller vehicles that are far more optimized for the existing market of payloads? After all, these smaller vehicles cost way less to develop, they're cheaper to build, they use less fuel, they require less infrastructure to launch, and so on. You may have heard it said that you wouldn't charter a 747 to fly something across state lines, you would take a small Cessna. This isn't actually true. If it was the cheaper option of the two, you would take the 747 almost every time. Wait, that's me! I said that! And as a side note, I generally don't like diving into surface level hypotheticals because once you start getting into the granular details, then you start going down weird paths that don't really make sense to compare the two. But in this case, you actually can. So on on the first note, a 747 will always be more expensive than a Cessna. This is a very easy trap to fall into. It's the dollars per kilogram fallacy all over again. Secondly, I was talking about regional airports. My hometown is about 70-ish miles from Minneapolis-St. Paul, so that's a bit of a drive, but it does have an airport. The problem is, it's a small regional airport which can't support a 747. So that's out of the question. And besides, even if I was somehow to make it capable of supporting them, the customer base for a commuter between small hometown to Minneapolis-St. Paul would always be too small to ever justify a 747. And even then, Think of how wasteful it would be to use a 747 for, you know, a handful of customers a week. As discussed in the series intro, Starship will likely be much cheaper than Falcon 9 to fly, meaning that every payload Falcon 9 has flown, no matter how small, Starship could have flown for less. Full and rapid reusability, if achieved, could make Starship cheaper to launch than most rockets in existence, even small launchers. And this is before we even mention ride-sharing payloads to save costs. If you're gonna claim that a super heavy lift launch vehicle will cost less per launch than a small lift vehicle, you're gonna have to substantiate that. It's are obviously in its wheelhouse, both to low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. As stated in the intro, Starship can launch more mass to GTO than any existing or planned competitor. Uh, where'd you get 30 tons from? Cause the user's guide, while out of date, does say 21. And I got 17 to 21 fully expendable. And it has enough room to rideshare several big satellites to GTO at once. 
Starship also looks well positioned to launch the ever-growing list of constellations. High launch cadence mixed with large volume and mass capabilities means Starship can deploy constellations rapidly, and it's even conceivable that Starship could deploy an entire small sat constellation in just one launch. So this is where Apogee and I are going to begin to differ. Sure, Starship could carry all of these payloads, but how many of them actually exist? This is why my analysis only focused on payloads that already have launched and extrapolated from there based on that market. Yes, we are going to see the emergence of mega constellations. The first Kuiper sats launched yesterday, but the question is how many of these will actually survive and use Starship? Mega constellations are still an iffy market. So that's why I didn't consider them back in 2021. The moon is getting more and more attention as NASA's Artemis program heats up. And honestly, it's hard to imagine a vehicle better poised to rake in cislunar contracts than Starship. Starship is likely to eat up a big portion of these contracts the later half of this decade, the same way Falcon Heavy is currently raking in lunar missions left and right. And this would of course be on top of all the missions for the HLS Starship and other potential future Starship roles in Artemis, such as bases and so on. Now, hot off the heels of Inspiration4, we have to talk about human spaceflight and tourism. Okay, I don't consider there to be much of a lunar commercial market at the moment. It's more speculative than mega constellations. And if one does arise in the near term, it's going to be smaller payloads that would more be easily fit on Falcon 9 sized launchers. Oh, and I will note that Apogee's creator does insist that Lunar Starship HLS only needs four tankers for resupply to go to the moon when actual people who work on the program and SpaceX themselves say it's. 14. And on commercial human spaceflight, I'm again going to note that it's still in its early infancy, so a very shaky argument to use. If Starship is going to succeed commercially in the near term, it is going to be flying conventional satellite payloads, not space hotels. A rocket arrives at the launch price. This subject is obviously pretty complex, so this example is simplified, but it should give the general principles. Let's say this green bar is the average price a customer pays to ride to space on this expendable rocket. We can break this price down into two parts. The internal cost, the price it costs the company to launch the rocket, and the profit, which is the- There's nothing inherently wrong with this chart conceptually, though I do object to the characterization of expendable launch systems. Reusability isn't something you slap onto something to make it low cost, nor is expendability inherently expensive. The only real issue I have with this kind of chart that he's presenting is he doesn't actually know what the breakdown of this is, and we just, and neither do I, I'm not saying I do, because they're private companies. They don't have to share that with us. I'll discuss this kind of chart in the LCLV video in the future. I think Apogee has fallen for the dollars per kilogram fallacy again. Sure, larger launch vehicles scale better than smaller ones, so the staff per pound gross liftoff weight of Starship is probably going to be better than Falcon 9 or Electron, but there's still going to be more people working on it because it's a super heavy lift launch vehicle. As for the rest of this chart, you are going to need to substantiate why Starships is so much better and smaller than a small lift launch vehicles. As an aside, why is it that Starship proponents' conservative numbers are all still wildly unrealistic? I don't get it. And someone did send me their own analysis of Starship launch costs, and their optimistic number was $600 million per launch. Who's the pessimist now? The reason I say this number is unrealistic is that if you actually read low-cost launch vehicle studies for reusable systems, those bottom out at about $200 to $400 per kilogram for a launch. And those are very idealistic. Multiple launches per day, ideal refurbishment times, airline-like operation, minimal staff, minimal development problems, no real issues with it. A, and a launch market that needs these many launches per day. You know, a spherical, frictionless launch market. One that's not happening anytime soon. Now I want to make a realistic manifest of future Starship flights. I think this will help us better visualize the amount of flights and the cadence of them. A realistic guess. 
Mars in the 2020s? Come on. We're gonna stop here. There is more to the video, but for time's sake, I'm gonna cut this down. And besides, most of it appears to be just unsubstantiated speculation, so what's there really to respond to? Before we make a conclusion on Apogee's seriousness, let's watch another one of his videos. This one could have been out of character, or uncharacteristic of them. You know, a fluke. The concept, from what I understand, comes from the misunderstanding that you can just mix and match rocket stages to build another launch vehicle, usually involving the hand-waving of the challenges associated with that kind of integration. The modern iteration of this concept seems to come from uh, Kerbal Space Program players and internet engineers who think that they're launch vehicle engineers. Can a rocket be Lego? Uh, yeah. Look. No, no, no. See? Look. My Delta II. That's made of Lego. We will discuss this as the video goes on more, but the answer is no. Not really. Let's see what Apogee has to say. And the guy weed whipping. Say it with me. Rockets are not Legos. But is this axiomatic phrase actually true? In my opinion, no. In basically every way that is meaningful, rockets are just like Legos. If when someone says rockets aren't Legos, they mean they aren't a plastic building block toy that utilizes a stud system to connect, then sure, I guess, what an astute observation. But if they mean that it isn't realistic to connect different rocket components together to build something new, then I disagree, and so does all of rocket history. Is it more difficult than a child applying pressure between two bricks? Of course, but I don't think anyone who has ever proposed a Franken rocket has made the claim that it was ever that simple. Oh boy. I have this strange feeling that your definition of Franken rocket or Lego rocket isn't gonna match up with what everyone else is claiming. A new rocket is proposed. There are only three possible categories it can fall into. Option one, every single piece of hardware is a clean slate design, 100% brand new, new engines, new tanks, and so on. Option two, some of the rocket is existing hardware with some modification and other parts are brand new clean slate design. And finally, option three, all of the rocket is composed of existing flight hardware, perhaps with flight modifications or upgrades. Now ask yourself, if a brand new rocket was being proposed, which category would lend itself the most credibility? Uh, that's not how people evaluate new launch vehicle proposals. Instead, you look at things like what market is it going to cater for? Low Earth orbit, geostationary, government, commercial? What's the cadence that they're proposing? For example, if a new company popped up and said that they were going to launch a rocket powered by the Saturn V F1 engine every day, would you take them seriously? This example does not account for that sort of thing. These two categories are what many people would mockingly refer to as Franken rockets. But Franken rockets seem a lot less ridiculous when you understand that the only other option is brand new everything. I can only think of a handful of Lego-ish rockets. Otreg, Conestoga, Athena, Eagle, of which only Athena ever really flew, of course. Solids are more amenable towards Lego-like construction. Now, I could be conflating Lego with modular, but the problem is most launch vehicles that exist today are just evolutions of previous versions, like the Atlas V. A Franken rocket, from my understanding, would be something like SRBX, which was made of shuttle SRBs, the Titan second stage, and a Centaur G upper stage. And a clean sheet designs what most private companies go for because, well, they can. They can design the rocket and their engines to meet their needs and specifications. For example, if I was going to build a pressure-fed peroxide propane vehicle for the Mio satellite phone market, because that's popping off, I'd have to go with a full clean sheet design because no one's building anything related to that. It's a lot easier to find rockets that were made like Legos than the other way around. Starting with the beloved Atlas V. By that logic, every rocket is a Franken rocket. Atlas V is an evolution from the Atlas III, both of which use Centaur and RD-180 engines. 
And that's an evolution from the original Atlas Centaur that flew in 1963. Atlas II used the standard stage and a half design on the first stage, as well as the classic Atlas balloon tanks. Atlas III incorporated the RD-180 engine and the balloon tanks. But by Atlas V, the balloon tanks had been phased out because the RD-180's performance was so good that Atlas didn't need balloon tanks anymore for weight reasons. I don't have access to the design studies for the Atlas Evolution because, well, that's proprietary and private, but I do have the user's guides, which discuss this. And you can look at the Atlas boat tails, the bottom of the vehicle, to see the evolution of the Atlas family. It's an evolution, not mix and match rocket design. And wait, the older Atlas had different upper stages. And of course, there were modifications associated with each, but you get my point. There were different upper stages for Atlas back in the day. Why doesn't Apogee talk about those? This rocket uses Soviet engines as well. Originally, it used the NK-33 engines from the massive Soviet N-1 moon rocket. After a failure with this engine, they changed to the RD-181 engines for the first stage. Much like one might change a certain Lego piece out for another should they desire, but rockets aren't like Legos. I looked for documentation of what the modifications were to upgrade the Antares from AJ-26 to RD-181, and I couldn't really find anything that's public. Most of what I did read suggests that almost all the modifications were for making the RD-181 out of the RD-191. Now, Apogee doesn't really cite anything, so I'm not sure if he was going to focus in on anything specific. The problem is that Apogee's definition of Franken-Rocket is so loose that I can't really tell what he's arguing for. At what point do modifications count against mix-and-match Lego? That would be a really helpful clarification. I am beginning to think that Apogee doesn't have a very technical or engineering background. Ares-1, which combines shuttle and Saturn parts. Its replacement, the Liberty rocket, which I kid you not, slaps the first stage of the European Ariane 5 rocket on top of a shuttle booster, which I can guarantee you was a real concept and also much crazier than anything I will ever propose. Countless shuttle-derived vehicles that were studied, and even various official proposals for multi-core Atlas variants. But I saved the best for last. Yeah, you could probably build some of those rockets. But what you're ignoring is that you'd still have to do modifications and other engineering to actually make them work. What's funny is that Apogee uses Falcon Heavy as an example earlier, but seems to ignore the fact that one of the big delays for Falcon Heavy was the fact that SpaceX realized you couldn't just strap three Falcon 9s together. Instead, the core of the vehicle needed serious structural modifications to accommodate the side boosters and loads. Proposals? Our proposals. I would encourage Apogee to actually read some of them. SLS, the poster child of all Franken rockets. Apogee is arguing against someone that does not exist. The ICPS is a modified version of the Delta Cryogenic second stage. The core stage is basically clean sheet. The solid rocket motors are new and modified. They have an extra segment on them. And the RS-25s, those are also modified to work for the core stage. What's the point you're even trying to make? You've already invalidated your own argument because by your definition, all rockets are Franken-rockets. I don't want to hear rockets aren't Legos as a response to a proposal that combines different rocket pieces with flight heritage. I specifically don't want to hear that phrase from those who use it to insulate the SLS rocket, which is the king of all LEGO rockets, from proposals that could offer redundancy for Artemis. You know what's funny? After all of this, Apogee forgets the one rocket that could have really helped his argument. Conestoga. Conestoga was going to be built out of existing solid rocket boosters and kick stages in a mix and match manner to carry a wide variety of payloads to orbit. I mean, had it worked, of course. Now, yeah, they'd still need some structural, you know, attachment points in the payload fairing, but that's as close to Lego as you can get. Also, Otrag is the king of Lego rockets. There, happy. And SLS is nowhere near a Franken rocket, let alone a Lego rocket. I'm not going to entertain the rest of the video. It's going to be just Apogee making Franken-Rockets 
and then justifying them with very surface level analysis. He wants to cludge together rocket parts to build an SLS equivalent, doing things like modifying Super Heavy to be shorter with a Centaur on top, or modifying New Glenn, and so on. And at no point do we see any substantiations for structures, trajectories, propulsion, propulsion systems, fluids, aerodynamics, trajectories, I already said trajectories, didn't I? Ground support, vehicle integration, abort capabilities, crew safety, a budget, timelines for modifications, uh, testing schedule, any of that. Instead, we get pretty pictures and just so simplifications that glaze over real challenges that these designs would face. At my job, where I'm a structures engineer on the airframe of an aircraft, I get to look at structural substantiations for installations that are either in or on the airframe. These substantiations include things that are even identical to other installations. You've got to prove it. You can't just say it is, you have to prove it. At no point does Apogee do any substantiations or studies for any of these vehicles. So we can dismiss them thusly. I've seen these kinds of designs and ideas float around on social media in certain ecosystems, and shock of all shocks, none of the people proposing these have actual engineering backgrounds. And the closest are computer people, which, ooh, and they've never really had to bend tin. Now Apogee, his background is... Industrial designer? Is that even real engineering? Wait, my brother's an industrial designer. I'll call him and ask. No, not paying the ransom again. I have a question for you. Shoot. Could you design this? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. I can't see. No, it, it's on the screen. Can't you see it? Do you know how videos work? Never mind. You're an industrial designer, right? Does this mean you took classes on aerodynamics? Air mechanics, propulsion systems, engineering, structural engineering, electrical engineering, fluid mechanics, and other, you know, engineering y things? Uh, um, no. Um, hello? Hello? You're still there? Hello? Yes! Yes! I'm right! Ha <laughs> ha! Remember last year when I made a video response to integrated space systems? That guy was just mad and in over his head. He hasn't made a video on that subject since, and we can just kind of, you know, push that aside. Apogee hasn't made a video since 2021, but their creator is still active on social media and making basically the same arguments. So the response here, the one I have to make, has to be a lot more substantiative than the one I did to integrate it. After all, Apogee is spaceflight industry analysis and opinion. That's a serious business. So, should we take them seriously? No, of course not. The Lego rocket video, honestly, doesn't make much sense to me. It feels more like a petty response to somebody. And I do hate to do this, but Apogee's creator's social media behavior suggests this. He's been known to double down and ignore actual industry engineers when they tell him he's mistaken, which is a rather immature approach to engineering. There's no substantiation, and it's clear Apogee didn't bother to do much research. Then let's take a look at the Starship launch market video. Apogee's entire argument is that Starship will succeed because of what he imagines it can do. At no point do we see real numbers or actual analysis. And Pretty pictures are not a substantiation. In contrast, way back in November 2021, I spent a full week scouring the internet 
for the dimensions of geostationary satellite buses so I could figure out how many could fit in Starship's payload fairing so that I could give you a good assessment of how many launches it could actually do. Apogee didn't differentiate between low Earth orbit and geostationary payloads, and at no point does he discuss the actual launch market. To add, he even lies about Starship's geostationary payload capacity. This is inexcusable and unacceptable. Apogee demands to be taken seriously, yet acts in an unserious manner. What annoys me most about all of this is the fact that he's willing to just make things up to support his conclusions. Also, if you've come here to defend Apogee, just remember, he is willing to lie to you. He's wrong. Anyone who has been caught in an echo chamber can see this. And no Twitter poll designed to get to the conclusion that you want, nor will people screaming at me, who are also wrong, change this fact. In fact, you don't even need me to point this out. Apogee is wrong and unserious. That's the conclusion. That's what I want you watching this to walk away with. Apogee is unserious. Stop engaging with him as if he is. He is untrustworthy. Don't reward this behavior. However, trust can be rebuilt. It is going to be a challenge since you are willing to make things up, Apogee, but with the right amount of effort, you can be taken seriously again. It starts with one thing. What a serious space-like commentator would do. Apogee, I want you to admit you're wrong. Where, where did you go? Hello? Hello?